until the session end, ends. And the session will end when this boat will go to the shore. And they are in the middle of the ocean. It can they take three days, four days, who knows. So before this majlis ends, it means the deal is not done. The guy who is who's with money will die out of hunger. He can't eat because he will always have this fear that the other party will terminate the transaction. The only way to, turn, to, to end this session that the, one, one of them jumps into the ocean and then comes back to the boat. So it is against logic. That's why Imam Hanifa Rahimahullah says that I follow the word of the Quran instead of following the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu. So that is the <coughs> uh, second cause. The third, apparent contradiction between the two ahadiths. And the example I have is Rafq al So Abu Hanifa rahimahullah uh, and Imam Malik, they both follow uh, one hadith. And Imam Shafi and Imam Ahmad ibn rahimahullah follow another hadith and they apparently are contradictory to each other. So, meaning one party takes one hadith, the other party takes another hadith. Now, what, when that happens, the easiest example that we observe day and night is Rafu al-Yadayn. Rafu al-Yadayn means raising your hands. So when you raise your hand in Salah, so the first time is when you enter into Salah. That is called Takbirat al-Ihram or Takbirat al-Tahrima, whatever you call it. Uh, everyone agrees, all the imma, that you have to raise your hand. Uh, there is no ikhtilaf. This is the consensus of scholars. Now the ikhtilaf comes when you, <coughs> at the end of the qiyam, when you go into the ruku, whether you should raise your hand, after, uh, after you make your ruku, you come back, you raise your hands or not. Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik, rahimahullah, are on the same page. They say you don't. And Imam Shafi'i and Imam Muhammad Muhammad rahimahullah say that you do. Okay, so uh, this is the ikhtilaf. There are two types of hadith. Number one, the hadith that Imam Abu Hanifa uses is the narration of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam raised his hands only in takbiratul ihram, meaning when he entered into salah. And then he never raised his hands after that. He's clearly saying he never raised his hands after that. This is a sahih hadith. We're not, we're not going into that discussion whether the hadith is daif or not. This is a sahih hadith, super solid. Then on the other hand, there is another super solid sahih hadith. The hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar and the hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anh. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anh says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam raised his hand when he entered into the salah and before going into the ruku and after coming back from the ruku. Again, the sahih hadith. Now you have two hadith sahih. Now what you do is a puzzle. Which one you go with? So, uh, now that opens up another discussion. That what is the reason why we give preference to one hadith over the other? Is there any criteria? Or because I like this hadith, I follow this, and you like that hadith, you follow that? No, there is a criteria. And uh, let me tell you, that criteria has so many clauses. There is a muhaddith, his name is uh, uh, Irati, Allama Irati. In his book, he writes the criteria of giving preference to one hadith over the other and he was able to find out 120 clauses under this criteria. There are 120 different reasons uh, in, in light of which you can give uh, preference to one hadith over the other. Okay, now there is a story, an interesting story. And you will understand uh, what was the reason Imam Abu Hanifa went with Abdullah ibn Masood and Imam Shafi ibn Allah went with Abdullah ibn Umar's narration. Imam Awza'i the, perhaps you uh, heard this name second time. He was contemporary to Imam Abu Hanifa. Imam Shafi is not contemporary to Imam Abu Hanifa. Let me tell you uh, so that you uh, keep in mind. Abu Hanifa rahimahullah passed away 150 years after Hijrah. 150 years after Hijrah, he passed away. Imam Malik rahimahullah passed away 179 after Hijrah. How many years later? 29. Almost 39, right? Imam Shafi rahimahullah passed away in the year 204 after Hijrah. So Imam Shafi rahimahullah, uh, his death is after 54 years, Imam Hanifa rahimahullah's death. Then comes Imam Ahmad ibn Muhammad rahimahullah, he passed away in the year 241 after Hijrah. So it's almost 100 years after Imam Hanifa rahimahullah's death, 90 years. And then comes Imam Bukhari rahimahullah. Imam Bukhari is Imam Ahmad ibn Muhammad rahimahullah's student. Imam Bukhari was born in the year 194, died in the year 256. 194 he was born when Imam Malik had died, Imam Hanifa had died, Imam Shafi was alive, and Imam Ahmad was alive. 
So he had the opportunity to, under, to learn under Imam Ahmad. He couldn't, uh, because uh, when Imam Shafi rahimahullah died, it was 204. And Imam Bukhari rahimahullah was only 10 years old. So he didn't see Imam uh, Shafi. So Imam, 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 Malik, Imam uh, Bukhari passed away in the year 256. More than 100 years later, after Imam Abu Hanifa. Then Imam Muslim, who is a student of Bukhari, he passed away in the year 261. 261 after Hijrah. And then comes Imam Tirmizi. Tirmizi is also the student of Imam Bukhari and Muslim both. Then comes uh, Ibn Majah. Then comes Nasai. And then come other Muhaddisin, Ibn Khuzayma and uh, Ibn Hibban and Tabrani and so on and so on. Many. So basically, we have this solid collection of hadith starting from Bukhari. This is what we call this collection is called Sahih al Bukhari. We all know that. This collection came into being when? When Imam Bukhari was born. And he was born when? Uh, in the year 194. And he passed away in the year 256. So when he was adult, that's when he was able to write. Let's say he was 20 years old. That's when he wrote the book. So the Sahih al Bukhari came into being in. Uh, around uh, uh, 214 after Hijrah. 214 after Hijrah, right? Hundred, uh, around uh, 64, 64 years later after Imam Abu Hanifa Rahimahullah. So anyway, so we understand these uh, dates and it's easier to understand the Hadith now. Imam Uzai is contemporary to who? To Imam Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa Rahimahullah has a student, his name is Abdullah ibn Mubarak, a great muhaddis. Great muhaddis of his time. Abdullah ibn Mubarak traveled to Syria, to Damascus, where Awza'i lived. Imam Awza'i was the Imam of the Grand Mosque of Damascus. So Awza'i introduced himself and he said, You know, I'm coming from Iraq. So Awza'i was surprised. Oh, you're coming from Iraq? Learn from me. Uh, he said, Yes. So he said, The next question Do you know a person? He's, he's you know, kind of involved in bid'ah. He's bid'ah. His name is Abu Hanifa. Do you know him? So, Abdullah ibn Mubarak is a student of Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. But at the same time, his problem was that he was going to learn from Awza'i rahimahullah. So he couldn't reject his opinion. He couldn't say, well, you're wrong. He said, well, yeah, I know. Uh, inshallah, we'll talk about him. So he was holding a few books uh, in, in his hand. And the books at that time were not printed. They were all manuscripts without the name of the author, uh, without, you know, fancy cover and everything. So he had some books in his hand. So Awza'i rahimahullah, it was uh, the... the there were a few minutes before the Iqam. So Awza'i rahimahullah asked uh, Ibn al-Mubarak, can I see your, your manuscripts, your books? And he started reading. And he liked them. And then uh, he said, can I borrow them for a few days? He said, yes, why not? And then he read those books and he came back to uh, Abdullah al-Mubarak and he said, you know, whoever wrote this book, you must go and learn the aim from him. So Imam Abdullah al-Mubarak said, well, I already did. Because this, the author of these books is the same bidati that uh, you call Abu Hanifa. So Awza'i rahimahullah basically didn't know, didn't have the proper information because obviously there was no strong communication between uh, Iraq and Syria. People would reach from one place to another in months. So it is possible that rumors reach first before the proper information. And Imam Awza'i rahimahullah found out, well now Abu Hanifa rahimahullah had ill. Anyway, after this incident, they both went, who? Abu Hanifa and Awza'i rahimahullah happened to be in Mecca for Hajj. And they both lived in the same neighborhood, it's called Darul Hanati. They both lived in the same uh, area and they met there. They both appreciated the scholarship of each other. See, and, and they understood the position of each other. So Imam Awza'i rahimahullah and Imam Abu Hanifa, they both met in uh, Makkah. And Awza'i asked the question. And he said, oh, Abu Hanifa, tell me one thing. How come you don't raise your hand in the salah after when you make ruku and when you come back from ruku? So, uh, Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah says, and why you do it? Can you tell me your reason? He said, what? Yeah, because I have a hadith. The hadith is and he narrates his son. He said, he says, Haddasana al-Zuhri qala haddasana al-Salim ala Abdullah ibn Umar. Zuhri ibn Shihab al-Zuhri, the first who compiled the hadith. Uh, he narrated to me. Who? Awza'i saying. Zuhri narrated to me. And Zuhri says, Salim, who is the son of Ibn Umar. His grandson of Umar ibn Khattab. So Zuhri says, Salim narrated to me. And Salim says, my father Ibn Umar narrated to me. That the Prophet ﷺ raised his hands before ruku and after ruku. So, I mean, there's no question about the credibility of these ruwat. Ibn Shuhab al Zuhri, a great name. You know, you cannot even, if a person finds out the credibility of Ibn Shuhab al Zuhri, it means he knows nothing. So, just like there is no question about Imam Bukhari's credibility, if a person comes out and he says, well, Imam Bukhari was da'if, you will slap on his face. What are you talking about? 
So similarly, Ibn Shahab Zuhri is a great name. There's no, there's no question about Salim. There's no question about Ibn Umar, he's a Sahabi. So Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah says, well, that's fine, but I also have a hadith and he narrates his son. And he says, حدثني حماد قال حدثني إبراهيم قال حدثني على القمة والأسود بن يزيد عن عبد الله بن مسؤول رضي الله عنه. The son of this, that my teacher Hamad narrated to me. And Hamad says, my teacher Ibrahim Nakhai narrated to me. And Ibrahim says, my two teachers, al and Al-Aswad ibn Yazid narrated to me. And they both said that our teacher Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu anh narrated to us. And Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu anh says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam raised his hands only in the beginning. He didn't raise his hands after that in Ruku and after Ruku. So we have two ahadith. And again, no question about the credibility of these what? Both sides have great, giant names. So, Imam Uzai said, what are you talking about? And look at, look at the argument. He says, what are you talking about? I am saying, Zuhri, Salim, Ibn Umar. Look how many names I have. Three. There are three generations between me and Rasulullah. And you're saying, Hamad, Ibrahim, Alqama, then Ibn Mas'ud. So you have four, four generations. How can you do this comparison? My salad is shorter. There are three people. Your salad is longer. There are four people. The shorter is the better. So my hadith should be given preference over your hadith. Therefore, I raise my hands. I know what, the, what you're talking about. This was his counter argument. Imam Hanifa rahimahullah says, Well, I don't do this comparison, the shorter and the longer. It is possible that the shorter uh, you know, is wrong and the longer is right. The comparison is a little different. How do I do the comparison? I see the ilm and the fiqh of each rabi. And I do comparison like this. I, I will compare the first rabi in my sanad and the first rabi in your sanad. So the first narrator in your sanad is who? Zuhri. And the first narrator in my sanad is my teacher, Hammad. Let's see who is more faqih, who has more fiqh, who has more understanding. Because the one who has more understanding will never make a mistake. So, he says, if we do the comparison, unanimously we agree that Hammad al-Afqahu min al-Zuhri. That the entire Ummah believes that Hamad has more fiqh than Ibrahim al Zuhri, uh, Ibn Shahab al Zuhri. Okay, let's go one step higher. So, one step higher is on your side comes Salim, on my side, Ibrahim al Nakhri. So he said, But Ibrahim uh, al Salim. And Ibrahim al Nakhri has more understanding according to the entire Ummah. This is the judgment of the entire Ummah that Ibrahim al Nakhri had more fiqh and understanding than Salim. Let's go one step higher. One step higher on your side, that is Abdullah ibn Umar, a Sahabi. And on my side, that is Al Qama and Al Aswad ibn Yazid, both of them are Tabi'i. Okay, that's the problem. On one side, you have a Sahabi, on the other side, you have a Tabi'i. Ibn Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah says, Lawla Suhbat ibn Umar. If there was not companionship of Abdullah ibn Umar, meaning if Abdullah ibn Umar wasn't Sahabi, suppose, then in Ilm, if, uh, the other two individuals, Aswad and Al Qama, would overcome Abdullah ibn Umar. Just because of companionship, he had the advantage of living with the Prophet ﷺ. He's called Sahabi and he's, he has preference over Tabi'i. But when you look at the understanding, it is possible that a Tabi'i has more understanding than a Sahabi. It is also in the Hadith. And then he says, one, let's go one more step up. You don't have anybody and I have Abdullah ibn Rasul. And he said, Wa Abdullah Abdullah. And Abdullah is Abdullah. There is no question about his credibility and his fiqh. Even the Prophet ﷺ made dua for, you know, for his fiqh. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted and his, he is someone that Umar ibn al-Khattab used to ask questions from. He is someone that Abu Bakr radiallahu anh used to ask questions from. He is someone that Ali radiallahu anh would be proud to have him in his city, in, in, in Iraq. So Abdullah ya Abdullah. So look at the, 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 the argument, the counter argument that Imam Al-Hanifa rahimahullah did. His reason of giving preference to the hadith of Abdullah ibn Masood is that all the dua between him and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa are afqah, they have more fiqh. And the reason that Awzari rahimahullah uh, give preference to the hadith of Ibn Umar, that it is shorter. I mean, both make sense. You cannot reject one or the other. If this is the reason, then why you raise the question against the credibility of any position or any fiqh position? I mean, you cannot say that those people who don't raise their hand are wrong, or those people who raise their hand are right or wrong. You cannot say that. Both of them follow a, uh, a hadith. It's just that one party takes this hadith and the other party takes that hadith and both of them have legitimate reasons which you cannot reject, which you cannot argue with. Uh, can you move to the... Okay. One more thing. 
there, there is a very uh, big misconception in our society that if the hadith is in Sahih al Bukhari, it gotta be right. And you have to take it. And you reject everything after that. Well, it is right. I'm not saying it is not right. It is right. But remember, and I'm giving you some numbers, and these are facts. You cannot ignore these facts. The total number of Sahih hadith is around 100,000. 100,000. 100,000 Sahih hadith we have. The total number of hadith in Sahih al Bukhari. If you delete the reputation, you know some hadith repeats, around 4,000, 4,500. If all the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari are Sahih and they are Sahih, it represents only 4.5% of the entire collection. Right? Out of 100,000, you have 4,500 4, uh, hadith, only 4.5% of the entire Sahih collection. How can you say that whatever comes in Sahih al-Bukhari is Final, is period, and nothing after that. No, even Imam Bukhari himself claims that if I doesn't, if I don't narrate a hadith in my Sahih, doesn't mean that hadith is not Sahih. I just didn't narrate it for some reasons. Yes, I claim that everything that I narrate is Sahih, but what I don't is Daif. No, this is what Imam Bukhari himself said. So we have to clear this uh, misconception. We have to, you know, uh, admit the these facts and figures. That if a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, it can be very strong, but it doesn't mean it is final. So, the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar, remember, that Imam Shafi Allah uses, it is in Sahih al-Bukhari. But the hadith of Abdullah ibn Masood is not. Can you reject the hadith of Abdullah ibn Masood on the basis of uh, the argument that I presented? You can't. Because there is no question about the credibility of all the ruad in the hadith of Abdullah ibn Masood. They are all on the, on the heights of credibility. Similarly, there is no question about the credibility of the Ruat and the narrators in the Hadith of Ibn Umar. So just like you cannot reject the Hadith of Ibn Umar because it is in Sahih al-Bukhari, how can you reject the Hadith of Ibn Masood just because it is not in Sahih al-Bukhari? So, we have to uh, you know, be very honest and informative you know, in, this, in this regard. That Sahih al-Bukhari is a, one of the greatest collection of Hadith that we have, but this is not a final collection. And uh, it doesn't represent the 100% Sahih Hadith of our tradition. And uh, being a Hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari is a strong point. Is a strong point, no doubt. Remember I just said, Allama Iraqi is a Muhaddis and he listed 120 clauses. So, and, uh, and, there is a, this, with, and it goes with the sequence. So the first clause is the strongest. You give in light of which you give preference to one hadith over the others. The second clause comes second, the third comes third. That's how he writes down all 120. So the 120th is the weakest reason of giving preference to one hadith over the other. Do you know, being a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, what is the clause number? It is 102nd. It is 102nd. So if the hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari, yes, you can give it uh, preference over other hadith, but you have to First check all 101 reasons before you come to this reason. You have to check all 101 reasons first. If none of those 101 reasons exist in that hadith, the only reason that exists is that it is in Sahih al-Bukhari. Then no problem, you can accept it, accept it and you can give it preference over the one that is not in Sahih al-Bukhari. But you have to check if the two hadiths are contradictory. For instance, Abdullah ibn Masood hadith and Ibn Umar of the Allah one's hadith. So you cannot jump to the 102nd reason and bypass all 101. You have to see first, on what basis I'm giving preference to one hadith over the other. And what all these 101 uh, reasons exist or not. If they don't, fine. Take the hadith of Ibn Umar just because it is in Sahih al-Bukhari. Right? So this is a very important point. And those who don't follow this criteria, look what happens. There is a hadith, لا يبول لن أحدكم في الماء الراكي. None of you urinate in still water. In still water, al al rakib the water that's not moving. There are some scholars who reject the, the, the philosophy of ishtihad and the criteria and the principles, and they say, you know, we're, we're independent, we can just, we just uh, connect ourselves to the Quran and the Sunnah directly without the help of Sahaba, without the help of Mujtahideen and Anima. You know, because the hadith is very clear, we are, we are, we are native Arabs, we understand Arabic language. So if the Prophet said, you know, do this, you do that. And what he doesn't say, you don't do it. I mean, it's, it's halal. So they used this hadith and they did ishtihad. And they didn't follow the principles of ishtihad and look what happened. 
according to them. And they were very few, and you know, uh, it's, it's, I, I'm just saying, uh, so that you know, the, the subject has been so dry, and it brings laughter on our face. So, they said that if water is still, you urinate in that water directly, it is haram because it is in the, in the hadith. But if you urinate in a uh, cup or in a pot, and then you put that water in that still water, or you urinate, urinate in that still water, it is halal. And if that doesn't make that water uh, impure, you can still make wudu. I mean, this is totally, again, it's, it's nonsense. Why they were they they had this approach because they did not understand the principles of ishtihad and that's why they made this huge great mistake that if you urine directly into the water then water has become impure you cannot make wudu but you threw your urine into the water it is still halal okay to drink and okay to make wudu so next slide please okay can I take the best of each school of thought another another million dollar question. I mean, you have four schools of thought, you have books available, you can read, and that happens. You have, you have certain, you know, in every community, you have certain individuals, individuals who like to read, and uh, they have, you know, good mutala, good uh, knowledge, good amount of knowledge, and they know different positions, and they know, they want to follow, they want to please everybody, and they say, well, you know, in this school of thought, this is the best thing, I want to follow this, From, in that school of thought, this is the best thing, I want to follow that. So can we take the best of each school of thought? So, first, in order to understand the answer, we have to answer another question. What defines something to be the best? If you're saying the best of each school of thought, then what defines it to, the, to be the best? The definition of the best is either it's easier or it's safer. There is no third that I could think of. Easier or safer. So, let's say, Let's take the first, easier. So, this position in Hanafi school of thought is easier, to, so I take that. In the, uh, that position, in that school of thought is easier, so I take that. And that position, the third one is easier in the Maliki school of thought, so I, I, I take that. So you're taking easier. And you're saying this is the best of each school of thought. If you're doing so, then you're not following the school of thought, you're following your own desire. The reason is that what's easier for me might be difficult for you, and what's easier for you might be difficult for me. What I think is easier, I'm following that, without any restriction. Then it is following the desire, not following the mazhab. You're just using uh, these mazahib for your own uh, desire and for your own nafs. Therefore, easier cannot be the best of all school of thought. What about the safer? It is good that we follow the safer, safer opinion. But if you do so, then one's life will be miserable, will be hell. How? Let me give you an example. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah says that if you, uh, if a person, if blood comes out from his body, Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah says that he has to repeat his wudu. Imam Shafi rahimahullah says no problem. Which one is safer? That you repeat the wudu. Obviously, that is safer. Because if you don't repeat the wuzu, what if Abu Hanifa was right? So safer is that you follow Imam Abu Hanifa Rahimahullah's opinion. Okay, let's take another masala. If you touch a woman, Imam Shafi Rahimahullah said that that, that breaks your wudu. Imam Abu Hanifa Rahimahullah said that doesn't. Which one is safer? Imam Shafi's. What if Abu Imam Shafi Rahimahullah was right and you didn't make the wudu, your salah wouldn't count. So the safer is Imam Shafi's opinion. Now, if you follow Abu Hanifa's school of thought, you have, let's say, 10 reasons to break your wudu. If you follow Imam Shafi Rahimahullah's school of thought, let's say you have 7 reasons to break wudu. But if you take the safer of each mazhab, you have 17 or 20 reasons to break your wudu. Right? So, a person's life is so difficult that 20 things will break his wudu. And if you stick to one mazhab, only 10 or 7 things will break your wudu. So, if you follow the safer of each mazhab, a person's life will be so difficult. If you follow the easy of each mazhab, then it's following the desire. That's why, can you say? Result is put the responsibility on the shoulders of those who are more learned than us and they know what they do. That's the end result. I mean, if I take the responsibility and then I tell others, most likely I'm wrong. If, I, if my uh, fatwa or my verdict is against the four schools of thought, most likely I'm wrong. Because I, I admit that I don't have that much knowledge. I just know a few names of the books, that's it. 
But if you take the, put the responsibility in the shoulders of those who are closer to the time of the Prophet وسلم, and definitely, without a doubt, more learned than all of us combined in the country. In the country, in the entire uh, United States. All the Muslims combined in one place, and let's put Imam Shafi on the other, other side, his ilm will be greater than, the, than all the Muslims on the other side. This is, I mean, guaranteed. So you put the responsibility on the shoulders of Imam Shafi Allah. If suppose he was wrong, he will take care. Why do we have to put ourselves in the problem? And if he was wrong, look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will treat, will treat him. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that if a mushtahid does ishtihad, and if he is right, he gets two rewards. And if he is wrong, he gets one reward. So he will be treated properly even if he is wrong. But if we do ishtihad without the capabilities of ishtihad, and if we try to understand the hadith without the capability of understanding the hadith, then there is no one reward for us. Even if we are right, we will still uh, get sin. Because we are doing ishtihad without the capabilities of ishtihad, without the condi conditions of ishtihad. Is there, is there anything after that? <clears throat> okay, this is just a flavor of talk. Okay, so if, uh, can you end the, uh, start the other flight? I will go real quick because I have to leave for the airport. My flight is at 6 o'clock. So, inshallah. I wish I could have more time. Okay, following the da'if hadith. Another very uh, interesting question. If the hadith is da'if, can you follow it? <clears throat> okay. What makes a hadith da'if? As I said that there are two points. A hadith that doesn't have the qualities of acceptance, <coughs> then that hadith is not accepted because it doesn't have the qualities of acceptance. It means it is da'if, it's rejected. What are those qualities? They are various qualities and they are of different levels. Let me give you next slide, please. Okay. Now remember, if a hadith is weak, there are two types of weakness light weakness and then extreme weakness. This is the second category. What makes a hadith light weak? For instance, there is a rabi, a narrator, and he has a weak memory. Look, if we all have weak memory compared to those people who lived, uh, you know, 1300 years ago. And we forget things. So it's called, we might have weaker memory than other person. He might have a stronger memory than, than, than us. But if we Forget. It doesn't mean that we're, we always forget day and night, everything we forget. No, most of the time we are right. And sometimes we forget. So there is a ratio. 30%, 70%. So if a person has bad memory or weak memory, it means all the hadith he narrated, he, the, the ratio is 50-50. 50% he was right, 50% he made a mistake in uh, narrating the exact word, wordings of the Prophet ﷺ. It makes the hadith weak, da'if, but it is light weakness. Okay. A missing link in the sun. From certain muhaddis to the Prophet ﷺ, you were supposed to have uh, six people, but you see only five names. Where did the sixth person go? Nobody knows. <clears throat> so, so this is a missing link. That also makes the hadith weak, but it is again light weakness. And then the third is credibility of uh, a narrator being unknown. So you know that person, the name is known, but what was his status? Was he, was he reliable? Did he uh, lie? Uh, how was his uh, salah in the masjid? Uh, you know, his, his background, you don't know, his, you, you have no background information. So the name of is known, but the credibility is unknown. Again, that hadith is weak, but light weakness. The second category is extreme weakness. What makes a hadith extreme weak? A narrator being described as a fabricator. If you know a person, this guy fabricated from hadith. His name occurs in 100 hadiths, all 100 hadiths will become extremely weak. Even those 99 hadiths were not fabricated. Because you, he was proven to be fabricate, fab, fabricated only in one hadith. But he committed a big crime. A crime that can never you know, uh, make him reliable in the tradition of hadith. Therefore, all the hadiths will become extremely weak where his name, name occurs in the summer. The second is a narrator being accused of fabrication. Meaning you don't have any proof, but you accuse him on legitimate basis. How? You see him all the time lying to other people in his conversation. 
So you think, you think, well, this guy lying for him is not a big deal. If he lies to others, he could also lie in a hadith. Therefore, you accuse him of lying, of fabricating. So if this type of person, he's called muttaham bil kadib. If this type of person comes in the hadith, then this hadith is also extremely weak. And then a person who narrates is fasid. He sins openly. These are three reasons what makes a hadith extremely weak. And the, the three first reason, the hadith, they, they also make hadith weak, but light weakness. Okay. A hadith is shad, is the fourth reason. And the fifth is the hadith is ma'loom. I don't want to touch these two things uh, because they're too complicated and we have very little time. So I just leave these two, four points because the first two points are more, uh, more important. Okay. Light weakness, no, very important note. Light weakness can be removed. Extreme weakness cannot be removed. How can you cure? If you have a light weakness, you know, you have a you have cold allergy. These are light illness, light sickness. You take the medication, it's, it's fixed. You're, you're healthy again. But if a person has, uh, you know, extreme level of illness, so no matter what type of therapy you provide and you do all the procedures, at the end of the day, nothing works and he expires. So it means light weakness can be removed, extreme weakness cannot be. Okay, so if a person has a bad memory, it causes light weakness. How can you remove it? How can you fix it? You see if the same hadith has another sanad, another chain of transmission or not. Yes, it has. Okay, that chain of transmission, all these individuals in the second chain of transmission, when they narrate this hadith, do they narrate the same way as this person with bad memory narrates or they narrate it differently? If they narrate exactly in the same way as the person with the bad memory narrate, it means he didn't make a mistake here. Other people are supporting him. His bad memory didn't affect. And if they are narrating differently than the person who has with, uh, uh, bad memory, it means this bad memory affected the hadith and he made a mistake. So you have to find out. Does it have another sanad or not? If you, have, if you see, if you encounter another sanad, it is easy to find, figure out whether uh, you can remove this weakness or not. And as I mentioned earlier, that I was able to find out more than 40 uh, chains of transmission of a single hadith and, uh, you know, figure, getting 10 to 15 uh, chains of transmission of a hadith is, is very easy. You can, you can do it easily. So, it's so easy to remove the light weakness. But to remove the extreme weakness is so difficult. How can you... Uh, trust the guy who fabricated one hadith. How, how can you trust him? There is no way he can be trusted. Even if he repents to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah can forgive him, but you can never trust him because it is a very, very, very sensitive situation or very sensitive matter that a person fabricated once in his lifetime, he can fabricate it again. Yes. Okay. One can follow a da'if hadith both in virtues and rulings. If you have a da'if hadith, light weakness, with light weakness, can you follow in fada'il, virtues? Like, you know, if you pray uh, two rakah at that certain time, you will get this much reward, the hadith is da'if. Can you accept that? Yes. In ruling, the, in the fiqh issue, can you accept the da'if hadith? Yes. With the following three conditions. Number one, must have a light weakness. The hadith has a light weakness. If it is extreme weakness, you cannot uh, use it. Neither in virtues nor in uh, rulings. Number two, there is no other hadith on that topic. There is only one hadith in the entire entire tradition of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that one hadith, one and only hadith, happened to be the with the light weakness. What would you do? You would just accept it because there is no other hadith. The third, it has no contradiction. It is not against the Quran. It, it is not against common sense. It is not against logic. It's not against another sahih hadith. Then you can accept it. Those who hold this view are, this is one point of view, but this is not the agreed upon point of view. Those who hold this view are Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. All four schools of thought follow this tradition that you can accept a da'if hadith with these three conditions. If, if one of these three condition, conditions is missing, then you cannot accept the da'if hadith. But da'if hadith can be accepted with these three conditions. Next slide, please. And then the second view is a da'if hadith will be rejected in both <coughs> virtues and ruling. As, 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 as soon as you see a da'if hadith, you know, you just reject it. We, 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 we don't follow it. Those who hold this opinion are Imam Bukhari, Imam Yahya bin Ma'in, Imam Muslim, 
Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah and Sheikh al-Bani. These are the individuals, and al-Bani was a very, uh, he, he, I think, passed away in the, uh, maybe 20 years ago. So within the last 20 years. So a recent scholar. So these are the people who have the opinion that da'if hadith is da'if hadith. We will never accept it. Neither in virtues nor in uh, ahkam, nor in rulings. But if you see, none of these names were fuqaha. Is Imam, Bukhari. Imam Bukhari could be faqih, but his fiqh doesn't have followers. Yahya ibn Ma'in is a muhaddis. Imam Muslim was a muhaddis, was not faqih. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, his hadith it was stronger than his fiqh. Albani, rahimahullah, was muhaddis only. He didn't know what, you know what the fiqh was. So if that's the case, then you will... And you're talking about rulings. So who will you trust? The fuqaha whose expertise was fiqh or the muhaddisin whose expertise was hadith? Obviously, you will go with the four imams whose expertise was fiqh and it was backed and supported by hadith. If you want to follow a da'if hadith in virtues and rulings. Next. <clears throat> and then, da'if, the third view is da'if hadith should be followed in virtues only, not in rulings. This is the you know, middle ground, you can say. Uh, but, again, the conditions are, must have light weakness, must follow a established principle of the deen, while acting upon it, one shouldn't believe it to be a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. should, you know, just have a feeling that I'm doing, following it uh, as, a, as a ihtiyat. And must not contradict a sahih hadith. Next. Okay, branding a hadith da'if is based on ishtihad. Now that we understood ishtihad and how it works. If a hadith is da'if, does it mean that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't say it? No. It is possible. It is possible that the Prophet ﷺ made that statement, but when it reached to us, the guy is missing, one person is missing. That doesn't necessarily mean that the Prophet ﷺ didn't make that statement. And, or, uh, it is possible that so and so in the Sanat has uh, bad memory. But this bad memory issue is also, uh, it is, it's not agreed upon thing. Let's say, there is a person in our community. And he, we were, we're talking about his uh, capabilities, his qualities. So there are, and there will always be disagreement because some some people will say, well, we'll appreciate his qualities, and you know, mashallah, very pious person. Other people, some other people will disagree. So there will be some sort of disagreement. This is exactly what happened with all the with these narrators. It is possible that a narrator was uh, called to have a bad memory, according to some muhaddisin. And he was called. He was uh, called to have a good memory, according to others. If that is the case, it means branding a, da'if, a had, branding a hadith to be da'if is just based on ishtihad, and ishtihad is never final. Ishtihad is never final. It is possible that Abu Hanifa's ishtihad is different than Shafi'i's, Malik's ishtihad is different than Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal's ishtihad. Therefore, if the hadith is da'if, it doesn't necessarily mean that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't say that. It is possible that he said that, he made that statement, but it reached to us through some unreliable sources. Okay. Okay, another last uh, point. The truth is what revolves amongst the four. Who are these four? If you see an opinion, either adopted by Abu Hanifa, Shafi'i, or Malik, or Ahmad bin Hanbal, one of these four then it, is, it can be right. If there is an opinion that was not adopted by any of these four, and it existed during their time, all four rejected it, it can never be right. Al-Haqq da'iun bayn al-Arba is a, an agreed upon principle of our Sharia, and this principle was formed after these four schools of thought emerged. So, why? There is a legitimate reason. Because other schools of thought didn't survive. So we don't, hold, we don't know the, the reliable sources of those uh, to, to check the credibility of those opinions. So that's why Al-Haqqu Da'iun Bayn Al-Arba, the truth revolves within the four mazahib. Okay, so if there is an opinion, nobody adopted out of four imams, rejected blindly, because it is not true. <clears throat> so, what do you do? What is, what, is the Da'if Hadith if it is a da'if hadith and my mazhab takes it, what do I do? Imam Bukhari calls the hadith da'if, but Imam Muhanifa takes it. 
What do I do? I will still go with the Da'if Hadith. This is very ajeeb. Why? I, if I know the Hadith of Da'if, why should I go just because Imam Hanifa said that? Let me give you a reason. Look, I mentioned the date. Imam Hanifa died in 150. Imam Bukhari Rahim Allah died in 256. So, 106 years later. How many generations are there in 100 years? Let's say four. So between Abu Hanifa and Rasulullah sallallahu how many links were there? How many links were there? Four. Imam Hanifa, most of his hadith had three links between him and Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The one that I narrated had four. So usually he had three links. Then down, 100 years down, add four more links. It is possible that the hadith during the time of Abu Hanifa rahimahullah was sahih. But when Imam Bukhari rahimahullah came and he receives it, you add four more people, one of them was wrong. One of them had a bad memory. And he said, well, the hadith is the real. So the hadith was sahih until 150 years after Hijrah. And in 256, it became the real. It is possible. And that happened. So if Bukhari rahimahullah calls the hadith the it doesn't mean that it is 100% the real. It is based on Imam Bukhari rahimahullah's knowledge and information and his istihad. If both of them were, the, both of them were contemporary, Abu Hanifa and Imam Bukhari, we could argue, we could say, yes, Imam Bukhari, Allah's ilm of hadith is superior than Imam Abu Hanifa, we go with Bukhari, fine. But if you have a difference of 106 years, four generations more, uh, you know, this is uh, at least, otherwise there could be five, six. So it is, the, the possibility is very strong that you have someone bad, negative, down the line after Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. So if the hadith, you are told by somebody that the hadith is da'if, and who said that? Imam Muslim said that, Bukhari said that, Tirmizi said that, so and so said that, and you think and you know that Imam Muhammad Rahimullah accepted that hadith. So, so don't have this misunderstanding, don't let this misunderstanding develop in your mind that Imam Rahimullah follows a da'if hadith, or Imam Shafi Rahimullah follows a hadith, da'if, a da'if hadith. None of these four Imam ever followed a da'if hadith knowing that it is a da'if hadith. This is a very important. Knowing that it is a da'if hadith, none of them follow it. Unless if there is no sahih hadith in the entire collection, then they all accepted it. But if there was a sahih hadith according to their knowledge, they accepted that. So, do you have anything else after that? <clears throat> okay. I'm not comfortable with a da'if hadith and want to reject it. Yes, you can. However, you have to be at least at the lowest level of istihad if you want to reject it. And we have already learned what are the capabilities you have to develop and qualities you have to develop in order to do istihad. If you are on that level, at least on the lowest level, most welcome to do it. But if you don't find yourself in that area, then don't uh, go to that area. If you, if you don't have license to drive, don't drive. Right? So if you don't have license to do istihad, don't do istihad. Simple. So... That's all. Jazakumullah khayr jaza. I hope it was uh, informative and you guys understood and we get the positive uh, message from this discussion. I would uh, prefer to answer your questions. But the thing is that it's uh, 15 to 4 and my flight is at 6 o'clock. I have to get to the airport and security check and everything. Uh, inshallah, I mean, if you have any question, you can, you can email or call me uh, or you know, some of the time if I get the opportunity to come, uh, we'll have, you know, something similar to this and uh, hopefully we, we learn all, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair and jazak. Wa akhu dawana alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Thank you for hosting me and uh, I, I, it was very uh, good to see all of you, mashallah. Jazakumullah khair.